Thank you. I just, can you hear me okay with this? Yeah, okay. Um, the first thing I want to say is um, I've been charged with discussing immigrant and refugee health um, in 15 minutes. And um, the world is a really big place, and people are from all over the world, of course, and different cultures and different issues. So I am going to talk in generalities, but a lot of my work was with, um, has been with, Arab um, immigrants and refugees. So that will be most of my examples. Okay, there I am. So awful with technology. Let's see. Huh. All right, so um, what we'll do is I'll go up here. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So the first thing I would like to do is give a couple definitions. And when we talk about immigrants and refugees, really who are we talking about? So an immigrant is a person who has planned to leave their country and move to another country. And in this case, we're talking about the United States. And the key there is really it has been a planned move. And there's um, a bunch of reasons why people may come. What um, the approvals for the US are um, for work, if we need certain work skill sets. Um, if people are going to be reunited with their family. And we also have a diversity um, level that we try to meet in the United States. The next group are refugees. And this is kind of the unplanned group. These are people that have left their country, and in this case, come to the United States. But really, the key is they've crossed their borders of their country. And they've left because, and this is from um, the UN uh, the United Nations Refugee Convention of 1951, that um, someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a, a particular social group or political opinion, that, and so they feel being outside of their country, they're safer, and they don't feel safe returning. And so again, that's the key. It's not really a planned thing, and, and often it's not what they want to happen. Oops, wait a minute, I'm ahead of myself. The, the next group is, would be asylees, and they are essentially very similar to refugees, but they have not gotten the approval of being a refugee. So they've come into the United States hoping to get refugee status. And this is important when we talk about what is available for those groups of people. And then the fourth group are the illegal, undocumented, or unauthorized. So all three terms are being used depending on what agency you're dealing with. And these are people that um, do not have the proper legal authorization to be in the United States. So it can be people that who have, have extended, have been here past their visa, so they may have had visas to come into the United States, but their visa ex has expired and they chose to stay. Or it could be people that have slipped in and crossed borders. So they're the four groups that we kind of talk about when we think about immigrant and ref refugee health or health of migrating people. In the United States, we have um, over 13% uh, over of our population is foreign born. So um, more than likely, um, you know someone who was not born in the United States or someone in your family. We have over um, 11 million unauthorized um, immigrants in the United States. And that number is an estimate because you, you can imagine people are not going to the Census Bureau saying, count me, I'm unauthorized. So. Um, you know, this is our best estimate, of, and this is the reputable sources. Of that group, there is over five million children with, that have parents that are unauthorized. And when we start talking about DACA and some of the stresses of being an immigrant in this country, I mean, you can only imagine the stress for the children that they may be experiencing, you know, living in a household like that and the stress of their parents. And then, I'm sure you've all heard about um, DACA and the um, legislation that is, um, being rewritten or revised. And um, so we have 800,000 children or, or youth who are 18 or below that would qualify for that. And so again, that's the group that all of these people would be considered vulnerable from a public health perspective. So I, I don't know if you noticed on my first slide, one of my credentials I've been adding lately, mainly because I'm I'm passionate about the care of these people, is I'm a granddaughter of an Irish immigrant. And so I just add that to my credentials to say, <laughs> immigrants can do some great things in this country. But I grew up being told that the United States was the greatest place to be. And that, I'm, we're not gonna debate whether that's true or not now or anything, but what, 
the message I got was people would do whatever it took to come to the United States. And that's what you know my grandparents did, and my great aunts and uncles, and my cousins. That's what they did to get here. But I learned later that that's not entirely true. It's true, but there's pieces that we're missing to that discussion. And it has to do with what makes people leave their country. Because the truth is, my grandparents would not have left their country if everything was fabulous. So we need to think about that and think kind of more upstream of what are those push-pull factors. And so in, in you know, the, the world of immigrant health and, and how we look at what brings people to a country, there are kind of um, those push factors, those things that make somebody want to leave their country. And certainly issues of conflict or war would make somebody want to leave. Um, not great job opportunities, and they can't make enough money to support their families. That would make somebody want to leave. Unsustainable living situations, not having enough water, not having enough food, a poor environment, that might make somebody leave. And then also other personal opportunities. Perhaps some, the, your family is in the country that you want to immigrate to. So they're, they're the push factors, and then what's pulling them is we are very fortunate in this country that we, don't, we have a stable economy. We have safety, and, and so that's what makes people want to come here. So they're the things you want to keep in mind. And when you're working with immigrants and refugees, to understand what were those push factors for them because that helps you understand their picture a little bit better. So when people come to the United States thinking from the health perspective, what is available to them? And so if we're thinking about dividing the groups into immigrants and refugees, immigrants, again, it's planned. So they are able often to purchase health insurance. So anybody can buy as long as they have the proper paperwork to be in this country legally, they can buy um, health insurance through private, you know, Aetna, Blue Cross, or any of those, those groups. They also could be eligible for low, lower cost health insurance, so, um, you know, depending on what their needs. They are not eligible right away for Medicare and CHISP, and CHISP is the health insurance for children. So contrary to what you hear in the news, that's not true, okay? You have to be in this country for five years as an immigrant to be able to qualify for those things. So please speak out when you hear untruths. The other thing, thinking about refugees and then people who are asylees that, that do eventually qualify as immigrants, in the United States, somebody who comes in under that status, they get health insurance for eight months. So they get medical assistance for eight months. And we're going to talk about kind of what are those issues for immigrants and refugees. They may, after that, be eligible for um, Medicare, Medicaid, or, or, or excuse me, Medicaid or CHISP, again, the... Um, health insurance for children. And at this point, as of today, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future, they can still purchase health insurance through the uh, marketplace of Affordable Care Act. And again, we're, that's still sort of out in Washington. We'll let them deal with that at this point. The other thing that if you, again, come to a country unplanned, they need to worry about housing. So they get housing, a stipend for um, short-term housing for eight months. Now let's think about this. What housing unit is going to give somebody an eight-month lease. So it tends to be substandard housing. So, you know, it's not, this is not a free trip, you know, that they're going to be living here in Villanova in a mansion. So let's go on a little journey. Here's a picture of Syrian refugees, and many of us saw this in the news. What kind of health problems do you just see looking at this picture? Go ahead, shout it out. Okay, now, where are you? Now, this is a problem. Okay, say it really loud. Stand up and yell. Dehydration. Dehydration, absolutely. They're going on this distance, and they probably, if they had water, drank it quickly. What else? Hygiene, right. So we can be at risk of infection. No food, so we can get some nutritional problems. We've, we've got some older people there. What's, I'm sorry, what did somebody say? Air quality. Air quality, yeah, right, right. We've got, it looks like somebody's covering their mouth. So if they already have respiratory disease or cardiovascular disease, that's being at risk. So we've got these old, and some, you know, we've got children and we've got some older 
people, and what do we know about older people? They're a vulnerable population. And what else about them? They tend to be on medications, right? Tend to have chronic disease. Do you think when they left Syria, they stopped by their pharmacy to get six months supply of their antihypertensive medication? Okay, so we've got people that are showing up with chronic disease that's not being treated, risk dehydration, malnutrition, um, and risk of infection. So we've already got people kind of behind the eight ball from the challenges that they've experienced. So people go into um, a camp often, um, and this is a picture again of Syrian refugees at a UN um, High Commission for Refugee Camp. Thinking about the health risks of crowded, being crowded, okay? So we again have risk of infection, risk of tuberculosis. So if people weren't already sick, we, they may have gotten sick, and they're showing up, you know, kind of malnourished, and so they're at risk for um, uh, their immune system not working as strongly as it could be working. So this is a um, picture of a college student at um, the health uh, student health services. So think of your own experience of what it's like to go to the physician or your health provider, hopefully a nurse practitioner. So, so what is that experience like? Is it easy? For you? Oh, it is? It's e okay, so it's easy. I, I gotta tell you, I think it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> you know, I mean, you gotta make sure you got the right insurance, you're making the time, and then you're sitting there and it's late. And, and, and I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse for 35 years. Um, and sometimes they talk too fast, I don't understand them. So let's now think about the risk for this family. What kind of things do you think about for this group of people? Yes, a serious language barrier. A cultural barrier, okay? We've got a man taking care of a child, but it's um, Muslim women. Um, added to the language barrier can be a barrier of understanding written material. So there can be a health literacy barrier, people not understanding what that health information is, not even like how are you doing today, but kind of bigger than that. And so we think people understand the instructions we gave them, but not, not necessarily. I don't see an interpreter in this picture. And so hopefully this man speaks Arabic. Probably not. And so just um, kind of as an aside, there is a law in, in, in the United States that we need to provide for um, proper language. So hope, ideally we have a live interpreter, but that's very expensive and challenging. So often we use a telephone line to help make sure people understand things. So we've got a, a system that's already complicated and complex with the barriers of um, language, culture, and adding to that culture, people may not understand how our system works. As I said, sometimes I get overwhelmed by it. And sometimes I'm just like, forget it, I'm not gonna do that because it's just too much of a pain. Now add, you know, not understanding that you need to pay for things, you need an insurance card, you know, and where do we get that card? So there's many challenges for somebody coming from another country. Another thing that tends to um, be a barrier is the perception of discrimination. I, I don't know whether this may, you know, we just have a picture. We don't know what, how he's behaving. We don't know what his thoughts may be. We don't know what these women's thoughts may be. But people may perceive that they're being discriminated against so they don't go to the health provider. And I've heard that repeatedly from people. They feel as though their health provider, you know, is not um, treating them with respect or takes time to understand them so they choose not to go. And that can be a problem. So the common health problems that we see, again, I'm taking the world and, and distilling it to one slide. Um, if I had to pick one, I would say stress, and that's why it's capitalized, and I shared some of those things. Um, we are currently working with Dr. Mariani, and um, some of you in this room have been to the National Health Service Center um, doing health access with um, immigrants and refugees, and we asked them to rank their stress 
It's on a scale of zero to 10. They tend to be at about eight to 10 of where they are with stress. And it's because many of these things of trying to get um, you know, housing, trying to get a job in eight months, they need to get a job that can support their family and, and um, you know, manage all of these things in a language and culture they may not understand. And so um, stress tends to be the biggest one. The other thing that um, we see and hear of a lot in the refugee population is people were either tortured or observed torture. Especially, I heard that a lot from Iraqi refugees. And so you think of the psychosocial and, and mental health problems. And so that, if I had to pick number two, it would be mental health. And that, as you know, in this country, we don't spend enough time on that for any of our citizens. And so it tends to go to the wayside for our immigrant and refugee population because they're so busy trying to just maintain things. For the adults, um, you know, they're like everybody else around the world with the big chronic diseases. So we've got um, cardiovascular disease, often, again, may or may not be treated, and diabetes. Um, cancers, they may, especially with the refugee population, they may not have been diagnosed, so we're just picking up a diagnosis often late here, or they may not, they may have been diagnosed and they may not have treatment, and so um, that can be a problem. Uh, with the Iraqi refugees, um, there have been some toxic chemical exposures, and so there's some um, cancers related to that. As far as the children, again, mental health is a big issue for them as well. Infections is an issue for both groups, but um, parasitic um, worms are a big problem for children, um, and, and TB for both groups. Again, thinking about the camps and how close people are. Several, um, uh, peop several of the immigrants and refugees that we've met have latent tuberculosis, and so as long as we're getting that treated, they're doing okay. And then also, as you mentioned, thinking about some of the nutritional deficits and the importance of that. Um, this is, uh, think, this slide is to remind me to tell you that we really need to, one of the things that, you know, what can we do for these people? One of the things is to sit down and listen to their story um, and, and just having an ear and remembering all the loss. This is a lady from Iraq who, um, when people, when, when people come over as refugees, families, even though you may have adult children, they get separated around the world. So her son, she had a son that was sent to Australia, one that was sent to Egypt, and one was somewhere in Europe. And she probably will never see them again. And I know that's not how she planned to spend her old age. So, you know, these are human beings behind these stories that we hear about in the news, and it's just not right. So we talked about that complex health system, and, and these are, again, just to remind me, and we talked about all of those things. So let's get into some solutions real quick. Um, uh, I'm a weird person. I take pictures of very strange things. So I was getting, I did go for one um, diagnostic test at Paoli Hospital. I did do it all the paperwork, all everything I had to do. And while I was sitting there being registered, they have this sign that says, we ask you because we care. And in the small print, it says they ask about language and ethnicity and, and you know, race to make sure that they're giving culturally competent care. Um, and so, now one could argue this was in English. <laughs> but, um, but they did, you know, so we're, we're making an effort, and, and they're doing it right out of the gate. Now, the other thing is, it can't just be this, this form. It needs to be health providers that are going to address the needs of the population they're serving. So that's something to think about. Um, on the positive note, because there are many positives of these, the people that have come from other countries, um, is they do tend to be younger, um, especially our uh, immigrant populations, and so they tend to be healthier. So they're not using all those services that you hear about in the news. Um, they also have, for the most part, have very strong family bonds. So these are things that you can kind of leverage and think about as far as health education and, and reaching more people. There are also, you know, in the Arab community, there are a lot of health protective practices that they do that we could learn from. Alcohol is not used. There's, um, tobacco use is, is not used as readily. It is used, but not as much. Um, and their, ten, their modesty covers their skin, so it prevents you know, risk of uh, skin cancers and other problems. So you know, there's some things that we can use to help build healthier groups of people. Um, the other thing, and I, I'm not going to go through everything on this slide, but what I want to say to you in, in closing, and then we'll talk about, hopefully on the panel, some of the things that we're doing and we can get people involved with, is 
that really take the time, most of you are nursing students, take the time to learn about who is in your community, who is the populations that are coming into your health institutions. And you can start really easily by going to a restaurant that serves that food. Go to an Iraqi restaurant or go to a Middle Eastern restaurant. It's a great um, <laughs> discussion uh, stimulus uh, with you and that patient of, hey, I just had this certain meal. You know, your food's really good. And, and you know, and who doesn't like to eat? So, so that's a really, you know, a great way. And I used to send my students in home care when we were in certain neighborhoods to go find out what people are eating and learn that. And the other thing is, as health professionals and, and as educated uh, Villanova graduates, we, we really need to get engaged with you know, everyone in our country and start advocating for them. And, you know, because we're hearing um, a lot of, I'm going to say, we're hearing nonsense. And so we really need to speak up and start advocating for, um, you know, the future of our country and, 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 and our immigrants and refugees. So, and the next, I, I'm going to, you can get out of here. Okay. All right, and I can talk about the rest. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. to come speak, sorry if this is, I'm to try to make this work. Okay, great. So um, tonight I'm gonna talk a little bit about the political realities that we're facing as a nation with respect to immigration, as well as some things that are happening at the local level, and then finally apply a type of framing mechanism for us to understand where we are and where we should go in terms of the question of immigration. And I'll talk a little bit about my research as well as we walk through this process. So I'd like first to talk about some complex political realities that we are facing. And if we just think about since January, you actually have a couple of initiatives that have taken place which have um, definitely brought the issue of immigration to the fore but have also put restrictions on flows of immigration like we haven't seen in the past. So um, you all remember the travel ban that President Trump um, signed into uh, as executive order in January 2017, and then there was a second draft in March 2017. The Supreme Court has that before its body and will be making a determination and a ruling, I believe it's the second week of October. Um, then in January, also by executive order, President Trump issued um, basically um, an executive order that cut, basically argued that cuts would be made for those cities that call themselves sanctuary cities, who basically limit cooperation with federal immigration agents. Uh, what's interesting about that is that then Jeff Sessions, who's the um, head of the Department of Justice, he also narrowed that and said that not only should those cities not be receiving um, federal funding, but those cities should also give federal immigration agents access to their jails and prisons just so you know, they're able to come and visit and see who's there in terms of deportation and detainer um, incidences. So this was challenged by a number of cities, um, Philadelphia being one of them, Chicago and Seattle, and in August. And more recently, a federal judge actually blocked this. So this is now um, basically not in existence, or at least not taking place. And then finally, the third um, and most recent was the failure to renew the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, what we call DACA by President Trump. Um, and this was put into place by President Obama in 2012, which basically allowed um, those who were here before a certain age, in this case 16 years old, to, um, to be able to stay here and not face deportation proceedings. And so this has been in existence, 800,000 as um, 
Dr. Um, Levy was mentioning, have been the beneficiaries of this. And what's interesting about this as well is that one of the reasons why the Trump administration actually decided to fail to renew DACA was because they were getting challenged by states who were basically saying, we're gonna sue the federal government for your continued support of DACA. What's happened after the failure to renew DACA is that a number of new states and, and the District of Columbia have now sued the federal government. So I'm, I have these arrows here to show you that it's such a complex reality because what you have, and so deliberations are underway in the Congress, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. But anyway, just to show you that it's not a simple story whatsoever. Just to give us some background, um, the DREAM Act, which I think maybe some of you are familiar with, the DREAM Act would be the legislative um, formal uh, policy of what DACA is. So for young people who have come here um, not on their own volition and who have maintained a permanent residence, who either have high school or GED, um, go to college, have military service, they, under a DREAM Act, they could get conditional um, status, which then could lead to permanent status and then a path to citizenship. All right. So just to give us some sense that we've been discussing the DREAM Act since 2001. And in 2001, um, what I have here, S means when it, where it was introduced in the Senate and HR is the House of Representatives. So from the beginning in 2001, the DREAM Act was a bipartisan act. And it was first sponsored by Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah and Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. And what you see is in all these incidences, so on the left-hand side are all the incidences of the introduction of the bill as a DREAM Act. Um, it was passed by the House in 2010, but the Senate was not able to pass it. And then the other pieces here are where the DREAM Act was featured either as an amendment or as a provision in one of the bills. All right, so I just wanted us to kind of wrap our, our heads around the difficulty in passing the DREAM Act. And then if we move to comprehensive immigration reform, there have been various iterations as well of attempts to try to pass it. Um, the most successful was in 2006 by the Senate and 2013 by the Senate. And again, if we start back in 2005, this was also a bipartisan effort. So it was McCain and Kennedy that introduced comprehensive immigration reform into the Senate. Um, but anyway, just to kind of help us to understand that. Now let's talk about polling, because what we're seeing in um, our country is that we find that many people believe that there should be a path to citizenship, but at the same time that there should be border protection and other immigration control measures. But I wanted to point out a couple of um, issues here in some polls. So this is all from Gallup. And if you don't subscribe to Gallup polling, you definitely should because it is phenomenal. You get them in your inbox. You can personalize what types of um, polls that you're interested in following. And um, anyway, they have a lot of great data on immigration in particular. So a couple of things that I want to point out. In January of 2017, 41% were very or somewhat satisfied with the current levels of immigration. Okay, that's the highest level of satisfaction since 2001. And this is up from 30% satisfied in 2016. So note the big jump of people from 2016 to 2017 with their satisfaction levels. 59% um, worry a great deal or a fair amount over illegal immigration. Um, this is actually down from previous years. The highest level of worry was documented in 20, 2006 with 72% of Americans. In June 2017, um, I'm sorry, in April 2017 about the wall, 
36% believe the U.S. should build a wall along the Mexican border. 56% um, disagree. But again, if we think about this in light of comprehensive immigra immigration reform and some of those measures, in 2014, people believed, 77% believed that it was extremely or very important to control our borders. 83% believed that we needed to tighten U.S. security in 2013. In 2013, 84% were in favor of employers verifying documents. And in 2013, at the same time, so here's where the complicated nature comes in, 88% of Americans favored a path to citizenship. And then I just want to add another um, important data point is the one that starred. 49% of Americans say that immigrants help the U.S. economy, and that's the highest level since 1993. And then finally, 35% of Americans argue that immigration levels should be decreased, and um, this has been steady um, since 2012. Um, but there's actually been the highest rate of those who wanted levels to be decreased was in 1996. So I'm telling you this story to basically show you that while these actions are taking place, and historically we've actually seen iterations of comprehensive immigration reform and the DREAM Act over and over and over again, at the same time Americans are conflicted about immigration, but they believe that immigrants are good for the economy, they believe that immigrants um, they're satisfied with the levels. So it's important for us to understand this context. Talking about services in Philadelphia, so just to give you a sense of the local level. So we looked at the national level, we looked at polling. There, I'm, I'm going to point out three organizations that actually provide immigrant services in Philadelphia. One is the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians which actually provides economic development initiatives. So they actually help immigrants foster their English language skills with respect to professionalism and obtaining a job in a profession that suits them. So for instance, many immigrants come over with a degree that's a medical degree, a legal degree, and that degree does not translate um, here. So what this organization does is that they provide them the opportunities to go through training and to think about other fields that might best utilize the skills that they already have, the medical skills, the legal skills, the nursing skills, and so forth. Um, so they also provide employment services and workshops, they have monthly legal clinics, and they just unveiled a citizenship project with the help of the Knight Foundation to track civic engagement of immigrants in the city. The second organization is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and this has been in Philadelphia since 1882. It's um, probably one of the oldest um, immigrant service organizations in the city, although there are ones that are older. Um, there are still organizations that are around that were here during the founding of this country, namely the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and a whole host of other immigrant aid societies. But the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society um, does refugee resettlement. They provide legal services as well, especially to asylees, um, citizenship assistance, and then they also provide technical assistance to other service providers who are in this space. So their field is really social services. And then finally, the Pennsylvania Immigration and Citizenship Coalition really um, basically takes place in the space of advocacy. And so here they do a lot of community organizing, capacity building for trainings around the issue of community organizing. They have lobby days in Harrisburg. They bring people down to DC. And what they do is they want to organize people. So if you can see their, one of their later latest um, campaigns is you know, encouraging people to vote against um, anti-immigrant bills. And so some partnerships and support of these organizations are also important for us to, to grasp. The Welcoming Center, which again is the economic development agency, partners with the Philadelphia Department of Commerce 
around the issue of business skills training. So the Philadelphia Department of Commerce provides funding for the Welcoming Center to encourage people around issues of professionalism, finding the right employment, and then also entrepreneurship. Legal Services HIAS partners with the Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, and what they do is they provide cross-referrals to other community organizations. And, they, and HIAS also mentors pro bono attorneys from private firms. So they work with a lot of private um, law firms who then act on behalf of those who are seeking assistance. And then finally, with respect to civic engagement, the Pennsylvania Immigrant, Immigration and Citizen, Citizenship Coalition partners with Ben and Jerry's Foundation. They receive assistance for their work in the realm of civic engagement. So just to kind of give us a sense, these are three organizations. There's many, many more. But these are well-established organizations that are helping us understand the diversity and variety of services that immigrant service organizations provide. So why did I get involved in this space? Um, what's interesting is that my background is, actually I studied Spanish for a very long period of time since grade school. And the sisters that taught me were actually from Spain and Cuba. And, and that's how I started becoming interested in the Hispanic culture and language and customs. Um, I spent, I did my master's in Latin American studies, spent some time in South America, waitressed off and on for six summers, and got to know people who were from different countries. And it really impacted me, people who were you know, working three jobs and trying to put food on the table, sending money back home because their family members needed you know, money for, for healthcare reasons, operations, and things of that sort. So um, anyway, this, my sister took this picture. I do field work. Um, She's my photographer. <laughs> and this was after Arizona passed SB 1070, which was a restrictive immigration law. And um, what we, Geno Stakes was actually having a rally in favor of Arizona to help pay the legal cost for the state. So I went down and covered the rally and the counter protest, just as to give you some idea of what types of work I do. I go to a lot of rallies. Um, and events. But these are the areas that I study immigrant nonprofit organizations, nonprofit government collaboration, and so forth. In my teaching, I teach graduates nonprofit management. And what I do is I partner students with nonprofit organizations, and then they do a project for them that then they deliver before the organization by the end of the semester. And so I just wanted to point out a couple of organizations that are immigrant related that we did, we had some partnerships with students, in this case, Congreso de Latinos, a 40 year old organization in Philadelphia, uh, four students and then was the acting executive director at the time. Um, they did a community research and event planning project for them. And then ACLAMO, which is a community based organization in Norristown, um, graduate students put together a personnel manual for that organization. And then in a few weeks over fall break, we're actually, um, I'm co-directing Villanova on the Hill with another colleague of mine, Lauren Miltenberger, and we're dedicating a um, pretty fair portion of our time to looking at the issue of immigration. So we're gonna have a panel on national security with Customs and Border Protection followed by the next day visits with Unidos US, which is the former National Council of La Raza, um, which is an immigrant advocacy organization, the US Chamber of Commerce and the Bipartisan Policy Center, which are all in favor of immigration reform. So how do we best frame this where we are now? I like to think about in the geographic landscape, we have both historic markers and we have mile markers. So historic markers help us to commemorate important events that have taken place um, or people. Um, and then mile markers tell us two things. They tell us how far we have gone and how much farther we need to go. And in the case of immigration, I actually think we can say that there have been a number of historic and mile markers in the last couple of years. 
So we can say DACA in 2012. Um, again, President Obama's exec executive order is an instance of a historic marker, but also a mile marker. Because as Obama himself said, this was temporary and it was a stopgap measure. And it's not legislative in nature. In June, um, on June 25th, 2012, the Supreme Court ruled on Arizona's um, immigration law SB 1070, basically shooting down a majority of its provisions. And then what I want to add, so at the federal level, you have um, this notion that the federal government is supreme in issues of immigration. At the local level, though, and I want to call our attention to this, since 2001, and Texas, I believe, was the first state to have a state DREAM Act, which means that states can allow those residents who are undocumented to pay in-state tuition at state colleges. We have 18 state DREAM Acts since then. And then since 1989, and I believe San Francisco was the first city to claim itself a sanctuary city, we see activity that is ongoing. So I want us to understand that as much as there's frustration around the issue of immigration, there's constant pushback. And there's constant debate as to who has the authority in the field. And I want to bring this to our attention, too, because DACA was not intended to be permanent. <coughs> President Obama himself said this is a temporary stopgap measure. Um, Reverend, Reverend Luis Cortez, who's executive director of Esperanza, more recently said that it was an imperfect way, but we need a legislative fix. Okay? So... Here's an incremental and bipartisan step that's now taking place in the Senate and the House. And we'll see what happens. So what's our path forward? And I know I've, I've gone too far over, but Tim is going to be talking about the role of storytelling and telling important um, narratives about people themselves who face DACA. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but I did go to a, um, these are actually from Pixar's Rules of Storytelling, so we can go over that at the end if you'd like to. Nonprofits have a role to play because nonprofits should be both providing services and advocating, as our previous speaker has mentioned. And this is what we call high impact nonprofits in the literature. And then most importantly, we need to have civil conversations. We need to come back to a sense of politeness um, we need to become highly depolarizing people, finding common ground where we can. And we need to think about fostering cultural competence at the organizational level and cultural intelligence at the individual level. And I can't agree more with um, Dr. Levy when she said, the best thing we can do is go visit an immigrant community have a meal, and start having meaningful conversations with people. So I'll end there, and I'll um, have Tim come up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Just make sure. Okay, great. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the College of Nursing for uh, inviting me to participate in this panel, uh, and thank you to Dr. Levy and Dr. Wilson, who did a wonderful job of sort of framing the issues and, and giving us a, a big picture view of um, what it means to care for immigrants and refugees. Uh, I'm going to speak a little differently uh, in the form of some stories uh, about people that I know. Um, I come to this issue with some different experiences. First, back in the early 90s as a junior in college, but also part of a military, military intelligence unit. And I was deployed to the Mexican border uh, with El Paso and worked with the Border Patrol and the DEA uh, down there for a while. Um, and that was another life. Um, 
and then later on uh, lived and worked in El Salvador for a few years, and then worked in Hispanic ministry for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. So these stories sort of come from people I met uh, with these experiences. So first I want to talk about Claudia. I met Claudia when I was living in El Salvador. My wife and I were living in El Salvador and working. And I was standing at a bus stop one day, and Claudia, who was 14, came up to me, and she offered to rent her body to me for $3. And I said, well, no, thank you. I was there as a missionary, so that would not have been good. Um, but I did invite Claudia to have lunch. And from there, we got to know each other, and we became friends. And Claudia was really a wonderful person. Uh, she had a kind heart, she had a big toothy grin, and she became a bit of a hero for me in the way that she sought to protect others. Um, but she did have a rough life. Uh, she was using drugs habitually and working in prostitution. Um, and that rough life, I'd often see, you know, a black eye or a split lip uh, when I was with her and would try to give her some medical care, um, food, and things like that. I always thought that Claudia had probably first been using drugs and then turned to prostitution to support that habit. And then I met her mom. And her mom told me that she had brought Claudia into the family business of prostitution at the age of 10. So Claudia never really had a chance. Um, so she and her, her mother, uh, it's not as though this was work that they, that they enjoyed, something that they wanted to do, but they felt it was sort of the best way of putting food on the table and a roof over their heads. Um, I remember one day driving home, I drove them home to, to their shack and I met Claudia's uh, sister and her five-year-old daughter. And I thought to myself, how long is it gonna be until she enters the family business? And my heart just ached. Um, so shortly before leaving El Salvador, Claudia and her mother were both diagnosed, um, tested and diagnosed HIV positive. Um, so we were able to hook them up with uh, some wonderful medical care, antiretroviral drugs, uh, food, and other social services through a married old sister uh, that I knew there. Um, but they didn't keep up with their treatment. Their, their life was just too chaotic. I went back to El Salvador a few years later, went to the park where I used to bump into them, and looking for them. And I saw two other women who were working the park. And I asked them, you know, have you seen Claudia and her mother you know, tried to describe them, and they said, oh yeah, we know them, and we know you, we know that you were their friend. Um, and they said that the mom had passed away, uh, and they weren't sure what had happened to Claudia. And we sat there for a moment, um, said a prayer together, we all sort of started to tear up. And the way they looked at me was if to say, doesn't it just suck that this is what we have, that this that we're living right now is sort of the best opportunity that we have in this country of very few opportunities. Um, and so my sense is Claudia did not ever try to come to the United States, but I share her story just to give you a sense of how powerful some of these push factors are for people. Um, okay. So my second story is about a man who was originally from Mexico. Uh, he was a legal permanent resident here, and, but not for very long. He had uh, his green card for about a year when I met him. He was in a convenience store in Philadelphia one night when he was uh, shot in the head. And I met him a few months, well, let me first back up. Uh, so he was immediately rushed to, I think it was University of Pennsylvania Hospital, uh, if my memory serves correctly, where his life was saved. In saving his life, they, need to remove, they needed to remove part of his skull because his brain was swelling and they needed to release the pressure. Um, so a few months later, it was coming time to repair his skull. And he didn't have health insurance. And the original surgery was covered by emergency medical assistance under Medicaid, which 
even undocumented people can, can qualify for if the conditions are right. But it ended as soon as that hospital stay ended. And he was having trouble uh, getting the insurance. The, the hospital, they had their money from that initial surgery. They weren't helping him with anything. The doctor was also not helping. Um, and it wasn't a lack of concern or lack of care, it was just the system's not set up to help somebody in that situation. So I was able to walk him through the, the process. Uh, we got certification from his doctor that this was medically essential. We got a letter from his employer saying that he couldn't work and that's why he didn't have proof of income. A letter from his brother saying that he was financially uh, taking care of him during this time and all this other sort of paperwork. And after a little bit of, of uh, haggling and things like that, we were able to uh, get him the health insurance he, need. he needed. Scheduling a, a surgery to repair something like that in advance is extremely difficult, um, but they were able to do it for him. And I share that story to say, many of you are gonna be nurses or other medical professionals. It may not be your job to be that advocate or help that person, but understand that there are people that need that advocate. And it's so often our immigrants, our refugees, people with a lack of English, oftentimes people with a lack of education, and they have to navigate very complex systems in a foreign language to be able to get the care they need. And they're not gonna have good medical outcomes without that. So to be able to push them to an advocate, find an advocate, uh, I'd encourage all of us to do. Um, and to say that that situation is not all that rare, I'm right now working with somebody who was shot six times in Upper Darby and survived. Um, and he needs to have his colostomy now reversed after about a year of, of healing and we're running into the same issue. So it, it, it continues. Um, so now I'd like to tell you about uh, Dulce. Uh, Dulce, uh, I met, she uh, is here from Ecuador. She's undocumented. She was pregnant with her first child. And the father was out of the picture. And she wanted to place the child up for adoption and ask me for some help with that. So I was looking into the, that process. And as anybody in the medical field knows, things don't always happen on time and often happen at the worst times. So one night at about 2 AM, she called me to tell me that she was going into labor. Now, she had been having her prenatal care at uh, Maria de los Santos uh, Clinic in North Philadelphia. It's a place that is accustomed to working with people who are undocumented, uninsured, and speak Spanish. So she felt comfortable there, that cultural competence. They knew how to take care of her, and she felt comfortable. Um, but she lived in Upper Darby, which is a distance away from North Philadelphia, quite close to here, about 15 minutes away. So we went to Delaware County Memorial Hospital. And from the moment we walked in, you could feel this attitude, this judgment. Um, it was sort of accusatory. Some of the questions I just sort of wrote down to refresh my memory, memory like, well, where are you going for prenatal care? Well, why are you going all the way up here with there when you live down here? Who's your primary? Where are your records? Why didn't you go there? I mean, these were questions that were coming at her. And I was interpreting at that time. Um, and the language line that we talked about earlier, sometimes that works well and sometimes it doesn't. And when a woman is in labor and laying back in bed, it's not the best time to stick a phone up to her ear, you know? Um, and I, I was just really amazed that the care was competent and from what I could tell, appropriate, but there was no sense of compassion. There was no sense of we care about you and want you and this baby to be okay. Um, and I'm hopeful, I, I, I imagine that all of you in this room would not be that way in caring for somebody who didn't speak English, who uh, didn't have their insurance um, and things like that, and maybe didn't do everything the way we would want them to do it. But there are colleagues that you work with who will have that attitude. So begin to think now, how would I respond if I witnessed a, a colleague acting in this way? Um, because I think we can do better and I think we need to do better. Um, let's see. 
All right. Uh, DACA. So one last story I want to share is uh, about a, a girl who's now 17. I met her when she was five and in kindergarten. Uh, she's from Honduras. She was born in Honduras. Her mother left Honduras when she was one. And when Kay, we'll call her Kay. When Kay was one, her mother left Honduras to come to the United States. Um, she was left with her grandmother and an aunt. Her mother was here for a few years, and what she met a man, and they fell in love, and they moved in together, and her life sort of stabilized, and she felt like it's okay to bring my daughter here now. So Kay uh, made the trip across the desert, across the border, with a coyote. Um, a coyote is somebody who helps to smuggle people into the country, if you don't know that term. Um, and was reunited with her mother, who she hadn't seen for three years. And when we talk about mental health issues, we see a lot of this. We see immigrant children coming from other countries, and maybe they haven't seen their parents for three or five or 10 years. And they may come as adolescents, and suddenly they're reunited with their parents who've been here for many years. And there's a lot of mental health and family issues that go along with that as well. Um, but to complete Kay's story, her, she wound up, uh, her parents, her mother and her stepdad, had three other children, and so they became what we call a mixed status family. So her half-siblings had health insurance, free school lunch because of income, could go to the doctor any time, and as they were gonna grow, were gonna be able to get a driver's license, work, be eligible for student loans, and none of that was going to be possible for Kay. Until 2012, with the DREAM Act, or um, with DACA, actually. Uh, and so when Kay was of age, she applied for DACA and was granted it. And right now, she's one of the lucky ones in that hers is expiring in December. Um, and so she's able to renew now. She's actually working with Hyas. Hyas uh, are the attorneys for her. And Pitt, Pennsylvania Immigration Citizenship Coalition, were able to come up with $500 or $495 for the renewal application. So she's working on that right now. And we'll get, hopefully, another two years of protection. It does not grant her status. It does not give her a green card. What it will do is allow her to work here legally and have a social security card. So she can get a driver's license and things like that. But there's nothing permanent. And what I want to say is the consequences of DACA are so important because somebody like Kay has been here since she's four years old. She knows no other life, really, than the United States. She's grown up like most of you have. Um, and if she goes back to Honduras, unlike many who have DACA, she does still have family there. But uh, her grandfather last year was murdered he was a local politician, and he was opposing the narco-traffickers in that area. So they took him out. Her uncle did the same, and he was murdered as well. So their family is targeted. If she goes back, also they know she's somebody coming from the United States, somebody with means now. She has a target on her. And so her being able to stay here is important. We're talking life and death here. Um, so. I know those are all sad and sort of depressing stories. It doesn't represent the wholeness of uh, immigrant people, refugees, or asylees, right? Because I've also been blessed in my work to uh, be part of celebrations, weddings, uh, baptisms, graduations, and things like that. And I think what we all need to do is to be conscious of the whole humanity of uh, all of these folks uh, in the hopes that we can provide better care for them and become good advocates for them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tim and Drs. Wilson and Levy. Um, I'm going to invite Katrina and her colleague. What's your name? Melanie, I'm going to get you a microphone in one second. Katrina, will, I know we're uh, like really close to the end of the, of the presentation, but I really think there's questions out there. So I'm going to man Katrina with this microphone. And then Mel, do you want to? Okay, I'll get this. Okay. So, if anyone has any questions, feel free to take the mic. 
<laughs> Hello, my name is Abiana Giaconero, and I was just wondering what are your thoughts on the Elian and Gonzalez case where family members in Cu where father in Cuba wanted the child to return to Cuba while family in the United States wanted the child to remain in the United States when the and when his mother had died in a crossing and he technically was legal due to wet foot, dry foot policy. So I'm just wondering what are your thoughts and considerations on that case? Your big picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can you hear this? Um, that's a great question. And I would have to re like revisit that case to be more precise in my response. But um, again, it, it shows you the complex understanding of, of immigration in, in that regard. And the push and pull, and here in this case, the push and pull with even family members too. So, um, but thank you for your, for your question. And I just have to, I'd have to get more up to speed because I haven't reviewed that in a while. The, the, one, thing, the one thing I would just add is um, sometimes there's a notion that life in the United States is absolutely better for someone. And in some cases, that is true. In other cases, it, it's not. And many people, I think, that do, especially refugees, asylees, would really prefer to stay in their home but be there peacefully with food on the table with education, with health care, and things like that. But when those are absent, that's when people start to move. So just that case, I remember there being this attitude of, well, obviously, it's going to be better in the United States for him. And so that's where he should be. And so I'm not saying whether it would have been or not, but I think we really have to think about that, um, that notion. So, um, oh. hi, I'm Julianne Smith. I wanted to ask, what do you, so what do you see next on the political forefront? You talked about kind of what's happened mm -hmm. and really kind of where do you see the direction and how do you see us in the audience as, I mean, you mentioned some of the advocacy opportunities, mm -hmm. but where do you see things going? Well, I think that the next step is, is definitely the DREAM Act. Um, in, in many ways, um, this should have been put into place years ago. Um, but again, the, the sense that it keeps coming up, I think, is really important. So I think we're not going to see comprehensive immigration reform anytime soon. But if we can make some incremental steps, such as the DREAM Act, and we can see it in a bipartisan manner. So in both cases, on the Senate and the House side, there are two bipartisan um, attempts that are being written. Now, in terms of what we can do, um, I think the most important thing is to talk to your friends and talk to people that you know, your family members. But if you want to get involved, there's so many organizations in the city of Philadelphia. So PIC is a good organization if you really want to get involved in advocacy. A faith-based organization that's really powerful is the New Sanctuary Movement. Um, they do what's called immigrant accompaniment, and then you get to know people walking through the process. Um, and many organizations hold lobby days as well. You can also contact your, your congressmen and women. But I think more importantly, what we need is to have civil conversations. We need to find ways to build bridges right now and stop using language that's shutting down conversation. And um, I think that we can all be mediators of that. We can all be using language that doesn't stifle conversation and also try to understand other people's perspectives, but then to understand there's a new way of looking at this. I actually think we need new language to discuss the things that we've been deliberating since 2001. I really do. But I think that that's hopefully going to be the next step. I think there's a lot of political will around it. Um, and then finally, at the city level, the cities are really experimenting more than the federal level. So there's a lot of amazing things happening at the municipal level that I think we should be looking at. 
Um, and they hopefully, if you think about some of the push and pull between the federal government and the states and the cities, the cities are really pushing back against what the federal government is doing. And they can actually do so because they have such a big population market share as well. So um, anyway, I hope that was helped answer your question. Um, could one of you talk to what efforts are being made or what activities are taking place with any of the organizations that you described to help um, immigrants and refugees um, overcome some of the, the really um, pronounced cultural differences in everyday life? Um, so uh, what the College of Nursing has... Um, maybe a 10, 12 year relationship with the Nationality Service Center, which is an immigrant and refugee resettlement organization in Philadelphia. And they do um, a variety, they have a variety of services, but one of the things that they do is they, they bring in their clients for kind of um, cultural experiences like a Thanksgiving dinner um, and introduce them to kind of, you know, how do you cook a turkey and what, you know, what it is that we do. And so they, they rely, you know, on those activities to help engage people. They, they also do, um, they will uh, bring their clients, their health section, so they have a health section and an um, English section and a legal section, but their health section will accompany people to their, their health visits to help them learn how to negotiate those um, activities. So those sort of things kind of help acculturate people. Uh, hi, could you um, just briefly talk about the impact, like so with this administration, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, the legislation that's coming out, um, the increased activity of ICE agents, what kind of impact are you seeing on the communities that you're working with? Is this causing more of a chilling effect with people coming to see, help, seek help from the, the community? Um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of fear, uh, certainly. And one thing that's interesting to me is people who in the past might have called the police if they were a victim of a crime, an undocumented person, say, who is a victim of a crime, um, they're not calling the police now. They're too afraid, and so when that happens, you know, crime increases. You know, all all of a sudden, this vulnerable vulnerable person is even more vulnerable. Um, the other thing I've seen is people sort of beginning to to pull back a little bit. Now, I don't know. You might have heard a few weeks ago there was supposed to be this Operation Mega that was supposed to um, happen just last week or this week, actually. Um, and this was supposed to be the largest ICE operation in history where they were going to round up about 8,400 people across the country in a five-day period. That was postponed because of uh, the storms, uh, so they say, or it might have been because it was leaked to the press. Um, but that's coming. Uh, we're going to see that action take place at some point. And um, I think what we're going to see is a lot of people be afraid to take public transportation to bring their children to school, to seek medical care. Um, there's, there's a lot of concern uh, right now with that sort of coming down the pike. You know, and can I just add, well, Michael, just a minute, <laughs> and then come on up. I'll but if, if I can just add, you know, we saw this after 9-11, uh, where, you know, the, we were afraid of everybody, and, and there was a whole discussion of we were going to report immigrants, and, and the public health um, organizations pushed back because we want everybody to seek medical care because that's how you get outbreaks and that's how you get real problems. So this affects all of us. Okay, Michael, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I know for refugees, like a big, a, a common reason we have refugees is like terrorism. But I was just wondering, uh, I guess, like in regards to climate change, like how our country is preparing for that and like more people moving like uh, northward and maybe more in like inland, like towards the Midwestern states that may not be as popular, like, I don't know, like high population, like yes, there are major cities there, but um, like, I guess very advanced, like healthcare is not there right now. And um, I don't know, how are we preparing for that in like a healthcare setting and bringing like advanced technologies that we might have here in Philly like over to, I don't know, more rural regions of the country. All right. 
Um, <laughs> um, we're not addressing it, first of all. But the, um, we are seeing immigrants and refugees. We're seeing environmental refugees, but I don't believe it's being tracked of this is why people are coming in. But, you know, if we look at drought and, and food, issues of food, we are, we're seeing those impacts. Arguably, and I've been thinking about this, we're seeing it, you know, kind of displacement in our own country with, with these hurricanes. And so, you know, we, we're seeing it. And it gets back also to the local level. There are some towns that are doing some really great job in building resilient communities because that's what we need to do. And there's some other towns that aren't. And so, you know, again, if we can get to the local level and, you know, all of you in your communities start having those conversations of how do we prepare for the changes that are here. And then those can be held up as best practices or examples for the, for the other rural areas. So we need to have communication going on between the exemplars, those that are doing it well, and getting that information out. So all of you who whatever field, you know, or whatever part of the country you live in can be those people who are communicating some of those messages. And that, that's really what we need. We need to be communicating what's working. You know, we actually know what's not working, but we really need to communicate what is working. There is, I forget the name of the organization, but if you Google migration and climate change, uh, there's uh, one of the top ones there has got some wonderful resources on tracking people that are moving because of climate change and how that's affecting things down the line, so. Any more questions out there? One more, right here? Two more, okay. Hold tight, I'll let you know who the partner is. In your previous um, comment, you were mentioning that on local level, we have to start like doing, um, supporting uh, so I want to ask about like the university here at Villanova, what the university is providing for um, people, refugees, immigrants, and such asylum seekers. Because I recently myself, as an asylum pending person, I, had, I was required to buy an insurance by the university. And I can't afford go, to go to hospitals right now because my insurance doesn't really cover anything. So is there anything that we could receive from the university as students here? I would start with the law clinic at mm -hmm. um, the, the, is it the School of Law or College of Law? College of, yeah. College of Law. Um, they have a, is it an immigrant clinic? I forget the title of it. So yes. there, they, they have a, uh, one clinic is for uh, refugees and asylees and another is a farm worker clinic. Mm -hmm. um, but they represent clients uh, who have cases in immigration court. Um, yeah. What you might be talking about more are, are uh, the health, health, uh, health, health center here. and healthcare because I did hear oh, about I'm the sorry. law, law. What is it called? Villanova Cares program. Yeah. Yes. But I was asking about the health center and the health. Uh, for for, for personal nurse. for like students that yes. that have. Uh, honestly, and I, I'll throw this out there to anyone else, I don't know that the university is doing anything for mm -hmm. our students for health access, and so maybe someone can... What is the university doing to help um, students who um, may have uh, either immigrant, some sort of immigrant status um, for accessing health care? And, and, I, and I'm just throwing that out because I'm not aware of anything that we're doing any... Thing. Yeah, I'm and just so, to so I would I, I would it. recommend that um, you, if you've already been to the law clinic, that's one place. Mm -hmm. But also the National Youth Service Center, they do help people um, make that access, and I can give you that information. Okay, thank you. Because we have Penn question? students that come there. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Just thank you. Thank you. Can you use the microphone? Yeah. We're still recording you. Thank the you. The question was about the travel yeah. ban. I have a question in terms of the travel ban. You said it's under a review, right? Supreme, the Supreme Court will make a determination. Um, I think it's the week of October 9th. 